Thank you for, uh, for attending. I'm looking forward to today's session and then the panel afterwards. Um, what we're going to talk about here is you know, changing the security equation. Um, so just maybe take a step back and talk about the things that are leading up and sort of operating security and sort of the, the things that we're up against in sort of today's computing environment. And then some areas that we can look to improve and, and better secure our teams and our, and our infrastructure. So the world is moving fast. <laughs> the world is complicated. I don't think this is uh, a really hard thing to grasp, but the idea around how incredibly complicated it is, is is pretty overwhelming. If you think about the systems, the digitization of your information, the accessibility of your information by customers, by partners, by suppliers, by vendors, by this entire ecosystem of folks that are outside of your traditional controls, all on a 24 by 7 basis or on a un sort of limited time gap here. It's just the length and the width of your technology and of your data and of your information is now exposed at much, much longer and wider timelines. So the idea of virtualization, cloud computing, mobility, all these advances in productivity that have uh, helped our society make tremendous gains uh, has also led to a, a really complicated, really complicated work environment where there are so many varying systems that are sometimes not really well connected, sometimes there's a lot of gaps. There's just a lot of room for, um, for an increased or for a larger attack surface for someone to, to potentially compromise. Nothing shocking there. Um, the idea, by the way, of pouring more devices on the network, pouring more people on to the internet and, and computing, right? We have, well, 2.3 zettabytes of annual global traffic, whatever, whatever that means. We've got entire, you know, IoT and ICS, as the last speaker had mentioned, you know, just a tsunami of devices being lit up, turned on, communicating back back to central or communicating across the environment. Everything from light bulbs to refrigerators to toilet seats is all getting wired up and, and producing information. So is there personal information? Is there just the ability to leverage these in a larger, uh, in a larger attack pattern? I mean, these things aren't necessarily built with uh, security in mind, right? They're built to be effective cost effective. They're built to share and provide information to provide better telemetry of data on usage. Again, incredible advances to society in general, but um, certainly a challenge in trying to keep this unever-ending sea of, of devices and things out there that are going to just propel us even more uh, with more, more space junk coming into the environment. The second theme that I find interesting is um, the profile, the attacker profile. And I like to think about the Industrial Revolution, um, you know, back in England in the turn of the century when uh, Adam Smith would talk about pin makers. And, uh, he, you know, you'd have a pin maker who would collect the iron and collect the wood, and then he'd have to make sure he'd, his fire and his smelter would be at a certain temperature, and then he'd be able to iron out and mash up, you know, three, three pin heads a day. And you know, incredibly long process with not terribly much productivity. But when you move to three blacksmiths working collectively, where one would be focused on collecting the firewood, and one would be focused on keeping the fire at the right temperature, and the third one hammering it out, productivity soared to 27 pins a day instead of just nine from the three uh, in an additive way. And the same kind of concept is here in, in security, in, in sort of the attacker profile. We have an amazingly mature uh, group of individuals working alone, working in isolation, and working as part of a broader context, and in, more importantly, an incredible specialization of labor. 
So you have individuals that are creating and researching software vulnerabilities, looking for exploits and how to compromise uh, certain systems. You have individual actors working on creating phishing attacks and going after individual users and how to socially engineer and, and gain access to their systems. You have folks that are creating that to um, creating, creating campaigns to take over computers and create botnets you know, around the world, you know, thousands of zombie computers. You have other individuals managing these. You have customer service individuals that are providing support online and telephonic support. Um, you have salespeople online that are, that are renting these things out. You have you know, money launders in the traditional sense where you're pulling data in from, from, from the e-economy and digitized down into the physical. I mean, this is just an overly simplistic org chart, if you will, similar to what we have in our you know, enterprise environment and an incredibly mature area where you have you know, the, the makeup of this economy is now larger than the drug cartel in, in the physical world. And that, that cross happened years ago. This is not something that just happened today. I mean, that is, that's a stat I've been sort of tweeting about for five years plus. Um, you now obviously have organized crime and crimeware families and crimeware organizations that are getting involved along with nation states. So it's, it is the industrial revolution in, in sort of this specialized labor. And there's a, a fun little video here that uh, we can watch for the next couple of minutes. You can dim the lights if you want. How did you decide to become a hacker? <laughs> well, I'm not really sure what it means to become a hacker. That's like some guy in a hoodie who types really fast and stays up all night writing code and cracking passwords. It's not me. I just spy on people and see what makes them click. It's not a bad job. Mark Hanning, CEO of Qualicart, said to report earnings after their blockbuster IP. So you consider this a job? I put a lot of work into this. I'm not lazy. It takes research to figure out the key players, learn all about them, their families, their friends, what they care about. You have to understand the company's organization. I get a lot of my information from the sales department because they're always so quick and eager. They're hungry. People trust too easily. They don't look at the details. I do. Details matter. That's what I'm good at. It has to look completely believable. It has to look familiar. This is where research is important. It's not some generic piece of spam. It's an email from their boss with their company's signature. It's written in the voice of the boss. It's what he would say if he were writing this. What about the malware itself? How does that work? Somebody else out there already wrote all the code that does the actual attack. I'm just using it in the attachment. My skill is in my ability to get a bunch of people to click on that attachment. I always wonder what it's like when the whole thing unfolds on their end, when the panic sets in. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Something's up with my laptop. I can't Katie, are you on your way to the office? Something's going on with our file uh, server. Uh, Karen and HR, our, our benefits dashboard seems really slow. We're getting calls from users on it. Apparently, there's a malware attack targeting our main... It's ransomware. They're holding us hostage. We're locked out of everything. I, I can't even check my phone. What about the backup? That will take days. We need this fixed now. Just pay it. We don't have a choice. We're reporting earnings in two hours. But how do we know Just that they'll... Just pay it. Put every single person on getting us back up and running. That's the only priority now. Okay, it's done. I have the decrypt key. Problem. The ransomware was just to distract us. 
They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Qualicart is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly the 2 Nasdaq million. The Nasdaq closed lower today, led by Qualicart, which was down 14% on news that their recent data breach may be far worse than the company originally its stock fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. I was paid to do a job, and I did it well. And that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. Yeah, it's, it's cool. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but it's dramatic. Uh, and it, you know, it outlines a lot of the things that we, we were just talking about, where just the segmentation of labor, you know, not necessarily people that you think are, you know, what a hacker would look like and what they're doing. And you know, I like the picture of her sitting, at, you know, talking to the barista, and you know, just looks like an ordinary person. So it's just very compelling and very interesting in how and how it unfolds. And guess what? It, it's real. And you know. You can go online and sort of more around sort of the maturity of this market, where you can buy credit card data for five bucks, or rent a botnet for sixty dollars a day, or purchase an exploit kit, or purchase social security numbers. I mean, it's there's a supply and a demand. There's buyers and sellers, and and this just shows the proof of the of the of the market in today's operation. I'm not going to dwell on this much. I think we've probably beaten you over the head. There is a massive ta talent shortage in cyber and security. Folks that understand uh, engineering, understand how sort of the network and information security principles and how to react and, under and uh, move forward on that. And so those are really the three major legs that I see of you know, a complex world that we're living in, a uh, more prolific attack profile that is very uh, much, that is more advanced than in previous years and much more sophisticated, and a, a talent shortage. And taking those three things, you know, in 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 sort of one message, there's no doubt that there's a continuing breach, daily, weekly, right? I mean, I don't have to talk about it much. You can read a paper, and on a weekly basis, you could read any number of breaches or attacks or compromises that have happened. And uh, I'm not going to say, hey, raise your hand if you've been breached. You have. I, I know it's funny. Some more than others, but you all will be. It's just a fact of working in today's operation. With those three panels, with those three main themes, it's impossible not to be. And so how do we kind of shift the equation a little bit from, okay, these are, this is all the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, doubt, and all the scareware that's happening on the stage to how can we actually deploy things that would help us um, in this modern day of, of compute. So one idea is, well, duh, more effective security technology. Um, how many of you guys and girls have cell phones that you know, are older than two years or three years? Right? I mean, you're buying these things on it. I saw you raise your hand. That's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, I mean, think about the computing and the usage of your iPhone or your Droid from a few years ago and how you just have to keep up with the pace of change. So, too, is your security infrastructure and the amount of pace, the pace and innovation happening within cyber is almost blinding. It's, it's truly amazing. So. Buying an old firewall and, or something legacy and kind of keeping it in there for five, 10 years is uh, absurd <laughs> to think that you can't keep up and keep refreshing and looking at newer technologies. Things like uh, artificial intelligence, looking at larger data sets, you know, big data, using machine, machine learning in sort of very pointed ways to gather more information to help, uh, to help your security teams you know, understand the data is at risk, and really leverage technologies to, to your benefit. It was mentioned earlier, but 
integrating security. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of uh, technologies out there, especially in cyber. RSA, which is a RSA conference that happens annually in California, there are about 800 to 1,000 to 1,200 vendors. It's an astoundingly large number of products, and each product or each vendor has its own pinpoint solution for a very specific element. How do you tie all these together and integrating information between them is something that um, I would really impress upon your teams to be much more vigilant, much more active on, on actually using the technologies and making sure that they're intercommunicating with each other. That leads to openness, which is a funny thing to say in the security framework because you know, usually security guys are you know, no, they're the answer and the king of no, it can't come in my network, it can't come in my environment. It's kind of the opposite of openness, but we we'll really have to learn how to adopt to share more information collaboratively amongst our teams with external partners and, and customers to share threat intelligence and share context. But openness on really demanding that your vendors are better integrated or can be better integrated to allow your secure teams to operate more effectively. Um, at Cisco, one of the teams that I have is dedicated to focusing on integration and information sharing amongst third-party products, amongst third-party technologies, security technologies. There are, you don't have to read all the little logos here, but there are a lot of big ones and little ones. We have about 140 some odd security vendors that are part of our program. Uh, about 250 some odd technologies that have been validated, certified, and that they work with our own technology or with other third party technologies. So we've published, we push out our APIs, we do these validations, we do these testings. Um, we have an incredibly mature economy and a mature approach because not as great as Cisco security is or as McAfee security is or as IBM security is, it's very rare that you'll just have one security vendor in your environment. And to make sure that they work together, that they're validated, that they work together um, is really core. And, and we do things with, you know, with IBM, you know, from a strategic standpoint, we've integrated almost all or a lot of our security products into their event management platform to simplify the operator's environment. We did a, a pretty big announcement with McAfee um, last fall where we're sharing our platform exchange. So all the information we're gathering on our infrastructure and our identity services engine, all that context can be shared with, with McAfee and McAfee partners through their EPO management framework. We're working with Apple over, over a year. We've helped them think through security on all of your mobile devices or your, your Apple iPhones and your iPads. You know, how can they open up those closed platforms to develop APIs so that third-party products can do a better job of managing and auditing these systems. So that, that's a, a really key area to, you know, to making sure you demand this of your vendors and that your teams themselves actually practice and, and, and execute on, on this integration efforts. And then the, one of the bigger themes I also find is reacting faster. Um, it was mentioned earlier, you know, we have the protection, detection, and, and then reaction. So on the protect mode, a majority of your budgets are gonna go into the blocking and stopping the threat now. And that's just the reality of it. That's where the biggest portion of the spend is in, in cyber. But what happens after that, that compromise? Or what happens after that, that attack comes through your blocking mechanism? I feel you know, some additional investment or incremental investment into detecting and then further reacting is incredibly powerful. Um, doing this through automation, this, this was a build slide, but we'll, we'll talk through this uh, slowly. Um, but the idea of automating your response, you know, something will inevitably get through, so when malware gets in and when it bypasses you know, your firewall, or your antivirus or other elements, what do you do then? And how do you find it sooner instead of you know, days, weeks, and months? How do you find that in hours? And how do you contain that uh, more quickly so that the, the, the width and the depth of that attack isn't as ferocious as it, as it normally would have been? 
And so within Cisco, we have something called advanced malware protection, where we're taking information on all the different uh, files and executables coming through your environment. And we're saying, hey, is it good, is it bad, or is it unknown? And we're leveraging cloud and, and some of our big data analytics and, and research teams you know, that are globally situated. And we'll say, yeah, these files are good, let them continue. These files are bad, and we'll block it you know, at the perimeter or wherever that perimeter is. And these files are unknown, so you know, where, where do we go from here? And as our cloud and our intelligence continues and our research continues to evolve over days and hours and weeks at a time, we can say, hey, that file from three days ago we thought was unknown or it was good is, guess what, it's now bad. You know, now what? And wherever you're deploying AMP technologies and some of our partners' technologies, you can reach out to the environment, automatically take reaction, automatically block, automatically quarantine. So the idea of your stopping something is great, but things will inevitably get through, identifying it faster, and then automating your response and kind of closing that loop to bringing it in-house so that your blocking technologies can now get smarter. So you're, you have something over here that was triggered or some kind of compromise here that happened on a smaller system. That information can automatically be fed back into your email security, your web security, your firewall, your identity management, so on and so forth. And so the idea here is, you know, we're, we have this three pillars of complex world, you know, the attack profile and the adversary is, is over communicating and working in, in really great harmony. <laughs> and we have this incredible talent shortage. You know, can we take these things and some of the advancements and some of the productivity advancements we've made with general computing in, in, as a whole and apply those to security? Can we better make things, can we make things work better together? Can we take snippets of, of you know, machine learning and big data and other analytics platforms to make us smarter? Can we automate these things to kind of bring the balance back to our security teams that are protecting our infrastructure and of course uh, the people that are using it? So I'll be here for the day and I'll be on the panel later on and I'm looking forward to meeting you. Thank you.